The title for this segment is Her Majesty number 534. First what? things first, if you got a kombucha in your hands and you're staring at a photo of the Hollywood sign while you listen to this because you're so ready to hear yet another Los Angeles tale, put down your bucha. <laughs> a majority of this takes place on the ocean. Oh I'm so God. sorry. And not the fun swimmy swimmy Pacific Ocean. I mean mm -hmm. like the Atlantic. I'm yeah. talking about New York, Canada. It's the land, Britain. the semen's the ocean. Sea, the, se the ocean semen. <laughs> There's a lot of semen floating around this episode. Watch your hands because they might. Made man, uh, Greg. No. <laughs> set this ring off. <laughs> Made man, say semen. <laughs> this ring comes right off when someone mentions Fleet Week. There was a, uh, a sentence in one of the books that was like, "Money was raised for semen's relief," and I had to close the book and take a walk because I'm like, I cannot believe those are two words. That Jack like, Frost, you did it again. You did it again. Yes, yeah, Ob, you did it again. Snowman, turn your framed photo. Of a bitch. Turn your frame photo of traffic on the five freeway around mm -hmm. because we're going to leave Los Angeles for a little bit. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. No more interstates. <laughs> it's a, uh, uh, what do they call it? The uh, Gulf Stream. Oh <laughs> the Queen Mary was the dream ship for Samuel Cunard. It was one of the biggest things built at the time. In 1931, the Empire State Building is built and it's only like maybe 250 feet longer and than they the- They tried to float it out to sea. <laughs> it keeps sinking. The unsinkable building. The Empire State Building is only like 250 feet longer than the Queen Mary, which is really? built around the same time. Oh God, that's, that's like uh, huge. I've heard of like cargo ships that are like this is as long as two empire state buildings i cannot fathom that yeah <laughs> it's ridiculous i've been on the queen mary and i, I didn't realize that. i knew that i walk like four miles but i yeah. didn't realize that i was on something as big as like the empire state yeah. building king kong and king um got it gulf stream there, <laughs> there was no other ship like the queen mary at the time yes the size and speed were remarkable and starkly different in terms of ships but also the queen mary was the apex of a long evolving technology of steamships well let's get into the muck of this segment because mm. like muck like hard muck okay the story of the queen mary begins with a company called cunard lines and the man behind the company its namesake was samuel cunard okay Sam i keep i kept thinking it was cunard because i kept thinking like oh cunard like the french word for uh duck or goose and i i just now realized it's not spelled the same I might be Canard. I haven't heard any, I, I haven't know. heard it spoken out loud. Yeah, I haven't neither, well, who would have heard the name of a defunct <laughs> luxury liner spoken out loud? Well, you don't go to a regular gas station and guys are talking about the uh, Canard lines. Sammy Cunny was born in 1787 in Halifax, Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. in the beautiful country of Canada. I don't know why I thought Nova Scotia was in Europe. It's not. It's in Canada. He was descended from German Quakers who settled in Pennsylvania in the middle of the 17th century and stayed until the end of the American Revolution. But why? We won. Why are you leaving? <laughs> oh, because his father was one of those people living he in the... He was getting away from Vietnam early. It's coming. This, <laughs> that 70s war. In 100 years, yeah. I, the prophecy said in the 70s. It didn't say what 70s. <gasps> you butthead or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, I already it's forgot. dumbass. You dumbass. <laughs> Butthead. What a bad show. I did not like that show. I like that 80s show. Oh my god. I rewatched it. That? No. I, I, it was like I, three episodes. Yeah, it was three episodes <laughs> long. Yeah, I didn't watch it. Okay. <laughs> Their family was here since the 17th century in Pennsylvania. They left after the American Revolution. But like, why are you leaving? We won. But some people, I totally forgot, were totally on the side of Britain. Right. They were British loyalists. Not, hey, listen. Not my Walmart parking lot, buddy. America, 100%. You know what I'm talking about? No British need apply. <laughs> Abraham Cunder, that was his father, was not only a British loyalist, he was also a foreman carpenter for the British Army. When the hillbillies and oh, the Yankees... there Yan you go. First they came for the carpenters. <laughs> and I said nothing. And then they came for the birds, and I said nothing. <laughs> <laughs> then they came for Peter, Paul, and Mary. And I said, take one, but leave two. Just leave Mary. Is the Peter Pete Seeger? Because you could take him, like, a couple times. Yeah, so they moved to Halifax, where he continued in the lumber game. Samuel was born there in Halifax, and his formative years were spent in the engineering department of his father's lumber yard, learning the secrets of being a shrewd businessman. <laughs> his father had several contracts with the government. After all, Edward Augustus, the Duke of Kent, commander-in-chief in British North America, appointed Abraham, master carpenter, the contingent department of oh the God, Royal these, Engineers. They, like, they were, like, entrenched in the British army. Yeah, they army were deep there. in there. So this guy... I don't blame him for leaving. I would have killed him. Have you seen America? Boring. <laughs> have you seen Canada? It's cold. I love it. He was in charge of, like, the entire lumber yard for the mm -hmm. British army. And this meant that Abe, of course, had pals in the military which is how at the age of 25 his son Samuel was able to train as a clerk for the Royal Engineers. He was the first clerk at the Engineers Lumber yeah, Yard. Give it up. The British, the Empire is dead. <laughs> Stop building stuff. You lost. Unless you're building, I don't know, Walmart. <laughs> Burger King. Yeah. Burger King. Uh, sounds kind of British to us. How about Burger how, President? How, how, how Burger, <laughs> about Burger Democracy. <laughs> Around the same time the Cunards, the Cunards, I'm going to try to say Cunards. It sounds more yeah. like the word I'm reading. Yeah. The Canards formed a firm, the A. Canard and Son, which was founded to enter the timber and West Indian trade. Oh I have God. no These, idea. This is British. It's very British, yeah. yeah. I don't know what West Indian trade means, but it feels racist. Yeah. All this to say, these <laughs> are- just seen Pirates of the Caribbean? <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing's about bargaining, right? Parlay, parlay. Parlay, parlay. Oh, third movies. By the time- <laughs> Good. 
It's so good. It's like the Godfather 3. It's just so, <laughs> so good. good. You can't mess this franchise up. All this to say that these opportunities allowed Samuel to excel in his industries. And by the time he reached his 40s, he was already a wealthy man on his own, being a merchant and trader and you know getting his name known in banking and lumber and coal and iron. So let's talk about a little bit what we gathered here on this podcast to listen about 19th century steamship mail service stories between Europe and the American East Coast. <laughs> Did somebody say cholera pandemic? The 1830s, though, are particularly important to the story of the Queen Mary. From the dawn of the transatlantic steamship mail delivery in 1702 to the 1830s, British government sailing ships handled the load. They took care of everything. But the service was very limited and inconsistent, thus unreliable, mostly due to the weather and the unpredictability of the mood of the North Atlantic Ocean, which was crazy. It was cold. The waves were, it was really rough seas out there. Must be on its period. I'm married. I can say that. <laughs> Before you're married, you're talking about ladies in general. Now you're talking about... Said, what specific lady? The ocean. <laughs> the ocean. The Atlantic Ocean. I'm married to her, ah, baby. that's who I married. Ah, ga, 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 ga. <laughs> In the 19th century, the big innovation across the ocean were clipper ships. Do you know what a clipper ship? Is. It's like a really fast ship, right? Yeah, it's really fast it because it clips along. Yeah, it clips along. <laughs> it's one of those that has like a series. It's like where only barbers allowed. Barbers and basketball players. <laughs> it's got square sails on like four, three or four masts on a ship. It's very like colonial looking, mm -hmm. like they're sail ships, like with sails. But and it is supposed ships. to be like. Fast? But they're fast, okay. yeah, because they rely mostly on sails and stuff. And they're like, they have like a really sleek design to right. them where they just like cut through air. I don't know what boats look like before. <laughs> they're basically airplanes. Yeah, you got it. You know what you're talking about. If you do a search for clipper ships, immediately you're like, oh, that's the kind of stupid ship. Clipper championship. About. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Even then, you know, these clipper ships, they're speedy and they're sturdy, but it was still a 30 day trek and it was a hard 30 days. A transatlantic trip was done out of necessity, not pleasure. The sailing was rough. The spaces were cramped and overcrowded. There was no way to cook on board during rough patches of so food was commonly an issue people would resort to cannibalism just to survive the 30 days across the ocean that's not true i just want to say that it sounds uh, like a it sounds like the truth though right? well because uh, i, I had, i've just recently listened to the, the lore episode where they talk about like cannibalism on boats because like they had a term for it it's like the way of the sea or Ooh. something like it's just kind of an unspoken thing of like if you get hungry you're gonna eat someone and that's fine <laughs> international the, waters yeah it's the way of the sea <laughs> anyway ships began to evolve with technology after clipper ships advances were made in steam engines along with traditional sails were allowing ships to make the trip easier but soon even sails were excluded as a ship like the, there was one in the 1838 called the Sirius uh, that crossed the Atlantic from Ireland to New York without the aid of any auxiliary sails hmm. it did it in 19 days which was like huge to people like you can do it 10 less days yeah. that's great here's money <laughs> many people like Samuel Connard knew this model could be perfected though weather and the rough seas were still the big issue here as it meant you could not promise a schedule to anybody but Connard was determined to resolve that issue I want to buy the weather but as a man of many industries he saw that regular mail service between continents could be very profitable if you could overcome the irregularity of the seas not only did samuel connard You're talking about eating people again the yeah, irregularity yeah, yeah, yeah. of the seas <laughs> what i see is i eat <laughs> and i seize you captain popeye out there too long pa popeye the scurvy man. <laughs> popeye the sorrowful man not only did samuel connard see the value of regular mail service across the atlantic so did the british government so in 18 over it so in we beat you we beat you, you. there is no more british what government setting mail about how you lost <laughs> jeez louise let it go can we borrow money <laughs> <laughs> can we have good bands we only about, have peter paul and mary <laughs> how about we send you some blues recordings and then you bring the beatles yeah. back remix this <laughs> <laughs> can you make this white for us 1838 they opened a discussion and invited bids from private commercial companies to handle the job samuel whose work in his father's company had given him some experience with dealing with ship service felt like he was the right man to take on this job he knew he couldn't do it alone but he failed convincing both halifax and boston in making this happen. He then traveled to Glasgow and through different channels met with Robert Napier, David MacGyver, and get ready for it. It's better than MacGyver? George Burns. Anyways, the three men agreed that this mail service across the Atlantic is a great idea and they want it. So together they formed the North American Royal Mail Steam Packet Company and later changed the name cleverly to the Cunard Steamship Company. Good night, Gracie. <laughs> Damn it! First Captain Jack Benny reporting for... <laughs> this is my first mate, Rochester. <laughs> Needless to say. He and three other guys that have no names, they form a company together, and it's like the North American Royal Steam Mail Packet Packet Company. <laughs> and then they're like, okay, great. How about we call it the Canard Steamship Company? And they're like, well, that's less words. <laughs> the wrong name, but less words. You mean words. the French word for duck? <laughs> the yeah. duck steamship company. Needless to say, their bid was accepted. Their mail service would run between Liverpool, 
Halifax, and Boston for a yearly sum of 60,000 pounds. They then went about building three ships to do this. The way the government was doing these trips before, it would involve three or four ships moving between continents, taking mail and uncomfortable passengers. Kennard and his team wanted to push for weekly sailings between New York and Southampton, and they wanted to do it ideally with two ships, but maybe three. But those ships had to move fast, like 28 knots, which it roughly translates oh. to 32 miles per hour. Not that fast, but on the ocean, I bet it's pretty That's high. all that translates to? Yeah. I thought a knot was like 12 miles. I don't know. But how could a boat? I don't know. I, I don't know. know. I don't Thir know the way of the sea. I've never eaten anybody. <laughs> Yet. Okay. 32 miles per hour is normally how fast I drive. If they wanted to go that fast, they had to be really big to house all the machinery that would have to go inside of it. So like I was saying, this is a dream scenario that they had to work to, is getting them to go that fast and then thus having to be that big. The first of which was the Britannia, which had her maiden voyage on the 4th of July, 1840, and left Liverpool. Let it go. <laughs> we beat you on the 4th of July. <laughs> this will show them. We'll send them a big ship that we built. This on will show their day. On their day on where their they beat day. someone. <laughs> they beat that weak country you've never heard of. <laughs> Some really strong handsome company that we've uh, <laughs> uh, com uh country um, i gotta go to the bathroom i gotta go to water closet i gotta go to the loo <laughs> britannia did the trip from liverpool to halifax in 12 days and 10 hours with an average speed of eight knots which is nine miles per hour what? she crossed wait a minute how could they be going slower but getting there in less time i don't i really don't know mm. i think it's bermuda triangle okay that's keep what it, going. oh yeah, yeah, yeah uh, it's a loophole <laughs> it's a porthole wormhole that's what i was going down for the whole time <laughs> following the britannia were her sisters the Acadia, caldonia caldonia and columbia most canard ships by the way <laughs> end with ia keep that in mind that's how they like to name their ships so these ships were the beginning of the canard line of ships and soon they were reaping in almost all the money from transatlantic passenger trade the money they were making were allowing them to evolve these ships at a faster pace by the 1850s they traded a wooden hole for an iron one the andes that's the first one that had an iron hole and then later replaced with steel on the servia which was in 1880 by 1862 they traded paddle wheels for screw propellers like the one on the ship the china in 1870s that gave way to twin propellers like the ones on like i'm so bad at these names lusania and campania they had twin propellers steam turbine engines became a reality in 1905 all the while passenger accommodations were becoming more and more comfortable canard led the way with private bathrooms and ship decks mm -hmm. where passengers can like stroll around on the deck I like private bathrooms oh my god my favorite thing ever <laughs> private bathroom no, I like other people's bathrooms. I like <laughs> private bathrooms from other people that I can use. The, I like filming private bathrooms, sure. My favorite military person is private bathrooms. They weren't the only ones advancing, though. There was the Inman Line, the White Star Lines, and the America Guyon Line. They were all tough competitors when it came to speedier travel. E.K. Collins was the king of the sailing ship world and created faster ships than Cunard could, but he went out of business in 1858, so we don't have to worry about him. Also, 1865, I should say that Sam Cunard dies of being alive for too long, but he goes out being a bear in like the first of his line you can get like if you have enough money you become a baron he became a and then everyone in his line is now a baronet or whatever <laughs> or a baron or whatever baroness after this a committee would handle all the canard line company matters so he's dead anyways 1897 the official fastest vessel came from north germany lloyd's ship something written in german the name of the ship is written in german i'm not gonna even try to pronounce it <laughs> it weighed 14,000 tons and traveled 22 knots this was followed by american vessel like 19 10 miles an hour basically yeah and people were like what? what i don't even see it <laughs> hold on to your butts <laughs> that was followed by american vessel in 1902 from john piermont morgan and some british cohorts who created a fleet of 120 liners that were pushing cunard lines out of the atlantic this was scaring a lot of people in high places a lot of British people in high British places. Mm -hmm. So something needed to be done. Cunard was then commissioned by the British government to build two ships that can maintain a speed of 24 knots in moderate weather. That's like 30 the, miles per hour. Yeah. <laughs> this show can go at a modest pace in temperate <laughs> climates. As long as there's no wind. <laughs> Your move, White Star Lines. <laughs> so the orders for the two ships were put in. They were the Maritania and the other ship was the Lusitania. Lusitania. L L the Lewis and Clark Itania. Yeah, what's it? The Lusitania. Lusitania, Lusitania mm. was the other one. Mm. I mm. see where this is going. The Maritania mm. was a truly how come none of these boats sink? Mm. This story is boring. When's something going to sink? <laughs> Nothing sinking in. The Maritania was a truly speedy ship. It hit almost 27 knots regularly, which was a big deal. The building of these ships caused a retaliation Might get from- a ticket for almost going the speed limit. <laughs> <laughs> the building of these ships caused a retaliation from Germany, who developed the Imperator mm -hmm. and the Vaterland. They also retaliated by sinking the Lusitania in 1915 after the outbreak of World War One. Oh, Jealous. World War One. Goodbye, Franz Ferdinand. Hello, mustard gas. <laughs> That's the name of my memoir of 90s alternative <laughs> rock music. A German U-boat downed the Lusitania and killed over 1,200 people, and it, it and it indirectly led to the U.S. 
to enter the fight in World War One. I. I forget why they 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 just just. Like, I think there was just a ship, and they're like F word that ship, right? Hmm. You know, it'd be funny. That meaning Flunkhausen, <laughs> which means sink in German. <laughs> so they sunk the Lusitania, and they killed twelve hundred people for apparently no reason. Mm-hmm. So that's how we entered indirectly entered right. World War One. Uh, who whose fleet was that? Cunard ship. Okay, it was a Cunard ship. Right. Yeah, it was a Cunard ship. Anyways, when the war ended, there were plenty of people looking to move, but how could they get around? So after the war, Germany was the lead on first class passenger travel for immigrants and immigrants. Yeah, because they're going to sink everybody else. <laughs> we're, we're safe we're here, the right? safe line. <laughs> we won't bomb ourselves. <laughs> the Germans were leading first-class travel between Europe and North America. <laughs> There's one thing we Germans will never do is take our own lives. <laughs> Passenger travel on the Cunard and the most British lines dropped because Germany offered newer and faster vessels. So it's 1926 now, and Cunard is looking to outdo the Germans, as everybody is. With all the new developments in marine engineering and naval architecture, clearly a sentence I didn't write, he knew he could pull something off really big, which is the part of the sentence I did write. In the 1920s, coal was being replaced by oil-fired boilers, and that really made the dream goal of two ships crossing the Atlantic instead of three a reality. Later during development, steam turbine engines using a single reduction gear would be the ultimate trick in gaining high speeds. I don't know what that means. I bet a ship person does, though. The design team for Cunard Steamship Company met in Liverpool, and the basics from what I understand in the conversation were... How big is the Mauritania? 790 feet. And the Aquitania? 901 feet. Let's make one 1,000 feet and drew a line on a piece of paper which represented a 1,000 feet long ship and called it a day. And by the way, drawing a straight line. <laughs> drawing a straight line on a piece of paper to represent a ship is so funny. This was the first stage of ship number 534 being set. Okay. The meeting is described like that. A discussion about size and needs, a line on paper representing the length of the hole, and off we go. From there, the Naval Architecture Department starts figuring out dimensions, weight, stability, and the power with the engineers, and then they create more elaborate sketches. And then from that point, the crew starts to construct it. The total length of ship 534 was set to be 1,019 feet and weighed 80,774 tons, which is almost twice the size of the Titanic, which meant that 534 would sink way faster. Twice as yeah. fast. Finally, a competition cunner could win. It can hit twice as many icebergs. <laughs> this means that an iceberg half the size will sink a bigger ship. This ship is doubly unsinkable. <laughs> so the size, of course, was an issue. Nothing that big had hey, ever... Hey, no, not something <laughs> I'm familiar with. Hey, get this ring off. <laughs> <laughs> it's the motion of the ocean. <laughs> that's, what, uh, that's what my wife says. It's uh, not the size of the the boat it's how mean the iceberg is that it hits. <laughs> it's how much water is in the boat right nothing that big had ever been built before a dry dock to build and launch from did not exist on either side of the atlantic also Wait a minute. Were... so that means they had to build it in the water they built it on a shipyard along the water but they Wait, had what's a... dry dock i thought i understood what that means and i don't apparently i thought that it was like almost like a shore yeah it's yeah. like a connected to water but you build it on the land and you just kind of nudge it <laughs> out <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna need someone who's twice as big as this boat it's kind of crazy reading about how they got got it from like a more dry surface where there is some water to the ocean i'll get to it but it's like crazy like uh, jewish slaves uh, sorry hebrew slaves <laughs> uh, can you build a pyramid on top of this <laughs> like generations of your family like you'll die and your grandkids will die and their grandkids yeah. will die building and then my grandkids will ride on this boat <laughs> in luxury and your great 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 grandkids will worship whoever's still alive by the end of this thing <laughs> history's great isn't it um so there was first of all nowhere to build this on either side of the atlantic there was nowhere on either continent to dock it when the ship did come in so they just saw well, we have the longest pier in, <laughs> La- in uh, Santa Monica. In uh, 1926, uh, I guess it was uh, burned gone. down before it got there. <laughs> Germans. So they went about it and they just solved problems as they went. Southern Railways constructed a massive dry dock in Southampton and the port authorities in Southampton and New York went about building a place to accommodate the giant ship. They contracted a group, the John Brown and Company, to build it in Clyde Bank, Scotland. They, that's where it was built. There's apparently a rumor that is unconfirmed, but I read it a couple times, that no women were allowed anywhere near the construction of 534 just to make sure a feminine presence doesn't distract a male worker from a delicate oh task god. at a critical moment oh my god we all know why women were invited rugged men necking <laughs> come on say it we've seen the village people perform <laughs> we know what one goes of them on. had a hard hat on okay and we don't <laughs> we, have a problem with it just call it what it is i know it happens in the navy <laughs> maybe they're afraid that the volume of that many construction workers and sailors whistling <laughs> cat calling <Ooh>. one woman <laughs> would please the foundations of the boat oh no an upwards avalanche <laughs> planning and designing took two years Years, and finally in 1930, the team ceremoniously placed the first rivet in one of the longest keels ever laid. The keel is the bottom of the ship, mm. by the way. They, I had to search that. But of course, the 1930s. Uh, what's a rivet? <laughs> <laughs> Slow down. What's a ship? Hang on, hang on. Where's Germany? <laughs> I 
<laughs> I'm still kind of curious about this U boat. How about me boat? Stupid jokes. Um, this is why nobody listens to us. But of course, the 1930s, Great Depression hit even in mm. Scotland and brought construction to a halt in December of 1931. I hope you don't steal my uh, little tidbit I have from this period of this boat. Cut me out. Scream. Yeah. This scream. <laughs> <laughs> it sat until April of 1934. Was that it? Yeah, I wanted to talk about April. You know I love talking about April 1934. How could you? Penny Goodman's on the radio. This is my honeymoon. <laughs> it sat until April 1934 when the British government agreed to pay the building of 534 and the sister ship, Queen Elizabeth. Oh, I'll get to it later. Yeah, we don't really talk about Queen Elizabeth. The sister ship is Queen Elizabeth. But part of the deal to finance the construction was that the Cunard Lines merged his company with England's transatlantic shipping line, the White Star. Right. He agreed. And- I knew that it was connected to the Titanic somehow. Yeah. I, mean, that's- I don't know anything else about that. Well, Titanic was a White Star ship. Was it? Yeah. So it was part of the same fleet you know what's weird i think my grandma came to this country on the sister ship of the titanic really yeah that's crazy it is crazy it's very brave of her did she like get to (laughs) she got the titanic too she came in like 1990 the iceberg (laughs) (laughs) the unwilling sister to the titanic um yeah my grandma was riding the iceberg and she got lost maybe i'll ask this boat for directions (laughs) sitting on the iceberg like frankenstein yeah your grandma has a lot of funny stories she does it's it's i forget what boat it was but i'm quite sure it was i think it had a few sister ships okay but one of them was my grandma. <laughs> <laughs> the name of the ship was my grandma. So they had a form with the Canard, the White Star, and it became the Canard White Star Line. It would be another two years of building before 534 was ready for the maiden voyage. By this time, though, the public was ready for this. It, it obviously knew that this giant ship was being built. Yeah, that, that's, that must have been so exciting yeah. for people like the biggest. Oh my god, they put right. the, the stern on it. Oh, people yeah. probably lined up in the dockyard on both continents. Yeah, yeah. I can't wait to see yeah, the boat. I wanted, like, <laughs> I bet you could have seen it from like two hours away. Be yeah. like, Whoa! <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> what the hell? The- yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go back to Liverpool. <laughs> Well, time to start the Beatles. <laughs> Pete Best. Time to start the Beatles. The band I'll be in forever. <laughs> They'll never kick me out. <laughs> Founding member of the Silver Beatles. Uh, and the Quarry Man. <laughs> Before it was built, obviously, public interest grew in the naming of the ship. So many of the ships had names that ended in IA, like the Mauritania, the Britannia, or Ick, like the Titanic or the Olympic. The newspaper published some of the names that the general public thought that the 534 should be called. Here are some of my favorites. Empress of Britain. It's not bad. Maritania. Georgia Maria. Maritania. Maritania. George and Maria. How about George Burns? No. What about Jack Frost? What about It's Solomon Show? Can't we call this one Milton Burrow because it's really big? <laughs> it can't be stopped by anybody? Because you could see it off the coast of New York? Because people begrudgingly write it? Because it steals the ideas of lesser boats <laughs> and then just uses it as its own? It shoves its way in every port it can. The King Georgia. The Majestania. Mm. The Atlantia. Mm. Blue Ribbon Dania. Wait. The Blue Ribbon. Blue Ribbon or Blue Ridden. Okay, I'm skipping that one. Bonnie Scotia. What? Invincia. Ratsunia. This one's hard one. Albert Wardia. <laughs> These are Aristocracy. This sounds like speaking of Milton Berle. Like this sounds, this like, sounds a, like a fake Milton Berle joke of like. And then the, yeah. Yeah, have you heard of these people from the Czech Republic? It They're sounds like how them how nice to meet you. you are. <laughs> it sounds like W.C. Fields explaining why some names are funnier than others. Yeah, yeah. Kalamazoo. And you're like okay. It's got to have a Q sound. <laughs> bon Voyage. Oh God. Liverpoolia. Transportania. Mammothia. How about Bodapalooza? <laughs> High Sierra. Hurry Homia. No. I knew that would be your favorite. Gargantutania. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's a pretty good that's one. That's a Godzilla villain. Yeah. Villain. Comfort. They're all villains. He's a villain too. Comfortia. <laughs> Britannia, which is already a name of a ship. <laughs> How about Lusitania? <laughs> no. Lusitania? Lusitania 2. Lusitania Tunia? <laughs> <laughs> if they named it Lusitania 2, it would have predicted World War II, by the way. None of these. <laughs> the Great Lusitania. <laughs> none of these were picked, though, obviously. Mm-hmm. In September of 1930. None of these were Pictia? <laughs> none, of, none of these were Pictia. All badia. <laughs> Bad <Latrosia>. idea, yeah. <laughs> Terrible mania. In September of 1934, the official christening took place at John Brown and Company shipyard. 200,000 spectators crowded that area. The ship they stood before was out of that area is also a possible name <laughs> too many people yeah the ship they stood before was immense like oh like yeah i could imagine the word sublime which is like it's so beautiful because yeah. it can kill me it's yeah. like comes to mind it was the awestruck <laughs> awestruck tenia it was the biggest man-made thing many people had ever seen. Yeah. There to perform the historic christening was Her Majesty Queen Mary with King George V. This was the first time in Great Britain's history that a reigning queen was to christen a merchant vessel. Did it have the name? It didn't have the name. There was no name yet. It's coming. Shut, shut the front door. <laughs> this was the fir- shut the front door. Yeah. <laughs> then King George V came to the microphone and said, "Today we can send her forth no longer a number of the books." But a ship with a name, alive with beauty. All this in a British accent. Alive with beauty, energy. Alive with beauty. The energy 
and strength of the stallion. I can't do it. The energy and strength and the stateliest ship now in being. And then her majesty, Queen Mary, stepped up and followed that up with snipping the satin. She started breakdancing. Yeah. And she did like that thing where you twirl on your back and people are like, hoo, hoo, hoo. And then she got up and snipped the ribbon that was holding a bottle of Australian white wine. It crashed against the bow of the plates. And the, the, I thought the, you were going to say it was holding the whole boat together and it just <laughs> fell apart. I used to think that you smashed it, but like this sounds like a Rube Goldberg machine where like, yeah, cut the ribbon and then it sends she fed white this wine. Mouse that ran to <laughs> this ball. Cheese, yeah. yeah. Imagine Queen Mary I know. just tossing a bottle of champagne 50 <laughs> feet. And pulls it out with her teeth and yeah, tosses it. A little for me, a little for you. <laughs> a bollocks of this. Wham. And then so she, you know, christens the ship and she says, I am happy to name this ship the Queen Mary. I wish success to her and to all who sail in her. <laughs> and what a name. But, but, did, <laughs> but was there, a, did they know it was going to be named Queen Mary or she was like, at the last second, they, I'm going to name this Queen Mary. Uh, let me name the ship for you. I got a good name for you. Yeah. You ain't heard nothing like this. Yeah, Queen Mary and the Marriott's. No, they called her beforehand you got to hear the story though so now okay. 534 is now officially the queen mary this right. force the crowd have obviously approved this was not only the first time a merchant vessel was christened by an active queen it was the first time a merchant vessel was named after an active queen here's the thing that i read on the queen mary website legend states that the canard directors went to king george v with his blessing of the ship's proposed name and they said we have decided to name our new ship after england's greatest queen they meant queen victoria the king's oh. grandmother oh. but the king got oh. confused because the king is reported to have stated oh my, my wife meaning my w- my wife my, my wife get my ring out yeah. my wife uh, my wife meaning queen mary will and be- you're saying George Burns isn't involved with this. <laughs> then Gracie's like, what, what are you going to name it after me? Yeah, so he was That's confused. That's so funny. How funny, like, Mary, you won't believe what they're going to name the ship. Mary, Mary, they're going to name a Mary, ship Mary. after you. And the, the <laughs> Canard guys are like, uh... Victoria fits in with our name scheme because of the IA. That's so funny. That's pretty funny. That's the legend behind it. And they didn't have the heart to be like, no, not your stupid wife. You stupid grandma. <laughs> <laughs> not just smelly old wife, just smelly <laughs> old grandma. grandma. Idiot. It's an episode of I Love Lucy. <laughs> this, this whole boat's story. Covered in a mink stole. That's fake. Anyways, it's named the Queen Mary and they she snipped the ribbon and the bottle smashed against the hull. What if as she's proclaiming it, someone from the canard is like, Victoria! Victoria! <laughs> what? And it emerges Queen Victoria from like a like a kiss like platform where she yeah, raises from the bottom playing a guitar yeah, solo a guitar solo already she learned the day before so anyways cut the ribbon bottle smashes against the hole and she presses the launch button and after a minute a low groan emerged from the ship as it slid towards the water of the Clyde River and into the waters. Apparently, I read this little blurb next to a photo. Okay, here's the thing about how it was tugged from a dry dock to the ocean. It's like six tugboats. I, I've seen this sort of thing where it's like these tiny little yeah. things pulling, you know, They're ant- trash ca- island or it, whatever. Trash island. It's like I an ant carrying a rock. Yeah, like it's I, preposterous. I don't get how but it yeah, works. It's like six tugboats are it, it's pulling like, the Empire State Building. It, it's like when you see like a little golf cart pulling an airplane You're through right. Right. across the tower. Right. I don't get it. I don't get Breaks it. Breaks her off. So apparently I read this little blurb next to a photo that the Queen Mary left the shipyard and went into the sea. I don't know if this is the same day or if they had a dry run to get into the water and then the christening was when it was mm-hmm. in the water. But how are you getting back out of the water? Yeah, it must be like the Hebrew th- slaves. <laughs> the answer to everything. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to mess up the tugboats. The tugboats need a day of rest. <laughs> um, and grain. Those tugboats get much more tired than the slaves do. I guess this is when they were bringing it out from the dry dock into the water and then from that point is the maiden voyage or whatever. It's coming out and people are like, you know, bitchin', bitchin' boat, right? A gust they of did wind. did it again, Queen Mary. What? <laughs> a gust of wind hit the Queen Mary. That no one predicted. And it turned broadside and <laughs> tilted. And the stern went deep and hit the surface under the water. And the tugboats had to pull the brand new ship to keep it floating. That was what? like first day oh no we forgot to put stuff inside of it <laughs> it would be another two years before the queen mary would be ready to leave the clyde river behind and become an operating transatlantic vessel that day came on may 27th 1936 almost 100 years since sam Kennard chopped his first wood wood exactly <laughs> when he started putting the apple seeds everywhere or whatever <laughs> when he first pitched to change the regular mail service of the ocean 10 years since the line was drawn on the piece of paper and one <laughs> day after the 69th birthday of her majesty queen mary nice <laughs> thousands of people were out on the dock just to see it depart and in the water with the queen mary were hundreds of smaller boats there to be in the same water as the biggest ship <laughs> to ever get built. in the way yeah i want to see how big i measure <laughs> up. you know how flies get all over the food you just made well, we want to do the same <laughs> thing yeah planes. it's like those little birds that land on a rhino <laughs> get off <laughs> you don't live here this isn't your house planes were circling above the ship with reporters and photographers some of the planes were throwing carnations down it was like baby jesus was being born <laughs> it was world war ii basically <laughs> <laughs> on board for the maiden voyage was 1742 passengers 708 of those were 
were first class, 631 were second class, and 304 were third class. So put labels on people. When, and here's their names. <laughs> and here's their ethnicities. <laughs> a crew of 1,186 men and women. Wait a minute. Women. The passengers were women on a women. boat. But the, the men will get distracted. <laughs> but wait, you said there was 1,700 passengers and a crew of 1,100? Yeah. What? There was a crew of 1,186 That's men and insane. women. That's insane. It's a big ship, but I don't know what they're all so. doing. Yeah. Probably 900 of them are like shoveling coal or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't think about that. Also on board were like 50,000 pounds of fresh meat, 50,000 <laughs> eggs, 14,500 bottles of wine, and 2,500 packets of cigarettes. <laughs> I think we know which class gets what. <laughs> you get the eggs, you get the cigarettes. Um, That's all you need. <laughs> there were 100 reporters and newspaper men on the maiden voyage documenting the event. I read that the BBC had installed 23 microphones throughout the ship like the engine room and the bridge and the main and the private bathrooms and the private bathrooms and cameras uh chuck berry was there 20 reporters were giving live <laughs> oh you had to get to liverpool to teach them how to rock and roll shazam chuck i'm gonna go berry. <laughs> shazam i'm gonna go start the quarry then. <laughs> it should also be said the captain of this big ass ship was commodore, big Asitania? commodore sir edgar Britton. britain a very royal very it. british get name over um, it. guys come on you lost yeah. <laughs> how about edgar charlottesville <laughs> not no Wrong choice. Uh, how about uh, Baltimore? No, the wire. Oh, jeez. Chicago, St. Clair. No. <laughs> What's an American city with a squeaky clean, clean past? How about Captain Little Rock? No. no. <laughs> I bet there's an American city yeah. out there that has no tarnished past. Yeah, what was that? New Orleans. I was just about to say, well, the docks in New Orleans where they <laughs> traded slaves. What was the name of that place? Yeah. Like, in Justice <laughs> Square. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, what you're looking for is San Diego. Anyways, oh, no, there's a mission in San Diego. Hmm, I can't do it there. Okay, so it has all these people, and it also has all this mail. Let's not forget its main purpose was... Semen or like letters? Well, the letters are full of semen. They couldn't send the dirty pictures through Instagram, so you would just send a package full of babies, potential babies. Sea letters. Sea letters. Mail like Let- my mom parcels. 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 Thank you. Parcels. <clears throat> Bills and parcels. parcels. You can't see me on pantomiming putting glasses on. <laughs> Ooh, the parcels have Suddenly arrived. I've read the word written too much. <laughs> the carrier must have gotten <laughs> me. Mm, my parcel from Amazon. <laughs> its first stop was in, is it Cherbourg, France? Uh-huh. Shiba. Shabam. Shabam. Where it picked up another 100 or so passengers and then some more mail and then off to New York. On its first voyage, they had their very first and very second hop-ons. Oh, no. Her first stowaway was a Canadian journalist who snuck on when they stopped in France. Her purpose of sneaking aboard was to loudly denounce the exclusion of female reporters invited to the maiden huh. voyage. The point of this was to uh, get it worldwide that that was a thing, so good job. The other stowaway was an unemployed laborer from Cardiff who, when discovered, was put to work in the kitchen. Yeah, and when they what do- he wanted. Exactly, and when they docked in New York, he was arrested and deported back to England. <laughs> oh, Two very different stories. Uh, Even though the Queen Mary was moving rogue market- The rags to riches <laughs> to deported story. <laughs> <laughs> the rags stay rags, the riches stay riches. <laughs> rags just keep getting raggier. <laughs> Even though the Queen Mary was moving remarkably fast, like 30 knots across the ocean fog had slowed the trip. two miles per hour fog had slowed the trip down and they did not the hell's fog what do we call it fat air fat, fat air, air had slowed the trip down and they did not they didn't break any records and arrived somewhat mm. late reaching new york on june 1st six days after departing yeah. people were just as excited in america to see queen mary land as in britain to they see weren't in the 1700s i'll <laughs> tell you that much who's this she's never been here she wants to tax us <laughs> how about senator mary <laughs> tens of thousands of spectators and boats crowded the hudson river as the queen mary landed for the hefty price of a dollar you can come aboard the ship and of course being new yorkers they took anything that wasn't bolted down ashtrays <laughs> silverware teapots for souvenirs also you already had two stowaways and your next move is to invite people aboard do you yeah. need more unpaid kitchen yeah. staff how about we get everyone from brooklyn on board <laughs> now the queen mary is in the ocean and it's operating let's hit 30 knots and get us to los angeles yeah that, we're what like an hour in or something and we have not even touched I los angeles very, <laughs> it, this is very not los angeles friendly it ends in it's, los angeles it does it's a it's, it's that we've taken this history this is ours now yeah this is a transplant we bought story. this history yeah, yeah. <laughs> the ultimate transplant yeah, the, ultimate the transplant. biggest transplant the big... you've ever seen also Yamama. Y- Yamama. also to add Yamama. so it's three months after the maiden voyage the queen mary takes the blue riband award for speed after it crosses the atlantic at three days 23 hours and 57 Whoa. minutes moving at a regular speed of 30 knots speedy queenie oh, yeah. wow that's really fast yeah so let's go ahead and describe i haven't done this yet it was actually 
somewhat hard to do. Describe the interior of the ship. Mm-hmm. We haven't done that yet. So what's on You've the ship? You've been on this ship. I've never I been have, on this ship. We should probably go one day. Yeah, I've been on this ship. It's when you park, you're like, what's a really big ship? And then you, the next day, because we stayed the night, we were walking around and it was like the most I'd walked in a long time. <laughs> the ship is comprised of seven decks from bottom to top, D deck, R deck, B deck, A deck, M deck, promenade deck, and the sun deck. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. D deck is where you board and then there's six. Obviously. obviously. D for boarding. D for And then that's where I believe like the third class passengers would mm. sleep on the- to board with the third class passengers? Get me on a golden helicopter the sun deck. It seems that all the fun is on the promenade deck, which I believe is first class suites. Under that was M deck, which is cheaper rooms, A deck, and thus. There's ballrooms, lounges, there's five dining areas coffee shops bars there's a mermaid bar which looks really neat there's two indoor swimming pools a gaming mm. deck a library a children's nursery and a playroom and a kennel for passengers dogs and by the way this will get scary again we haven't talked about los angeles we haven't talked about scaries two stuff we've promised at the beginning of this episode haunted los angeles history none of that has happened so far but it's coming. every six minutes can you just do that uh i, w- I would like to remind everybody i know that we're hearing about murals right now but it's it, uh, scary is coming soon you asshole yeah you butthead or you butt- <laughs> Mess. I have to set up why the ship's important. Sir Winston's was and maybe still is the ship's finding dining restaurant. It's right. located on the old engineer's quarters on the sports deck. I think finding it might have dining. I might have moved to the sun deck recently. I don't really know. There was beautiful suites for all types of first class passengers. The suites look so beautiful and spacious. In turn, the tourist suites, which is British for second and third class passengers, <laughs> were said to be obviously much smaller and even more cramped with the crew quarters, who sometimes spunked to tend to a room. The Queen Mary's interior is an art deco dream. A committee was set up to handle the interiors led by Sir Percy Bates, uh, Master Bates, Arthur Davis, and B. V. Morris, American. They assembled a team of 30 artists, sculptors, painters, and interior decorators. There is beautiful columns all throughout the ship. There's sculptures, there's murals. Doris Zinkinson, I think that's how you say it, was a famous costume designer for the films, and she was a painter. She did paint a lot of railway posters. She worked on the decor for the Veranda Grill, which mm-hmm. is the nightclub and restaurants on the Queen Mary. They let a woman on board. You're going to be working, right? <laughs> You're going to be painting the kitchen, right? You're going to be sweeping the kitchen, right? <laughs> she worked out all the designs for this room, like not just like, oh, this napkin holder, like curtains and mm-hmm. carpets and chairs like everything was up to Doris to do and it's like maybe the most beautiful room there her sister Anna and her also painted murals in the veranda apparently they were painting the mural that goes it's on the ship in Glasgow in a, like a warehouse and it was a busy warehouse and it's so funny reading quotes from her because she's like I like to work silent and there's all these men with wires behind me they're making all this noise and hammering so anyways she's painting this mural and the king comes in King Edward III God. was getting a tour and stopped at the mural in the painting on the mural there's an old lady with a tiara and a necklace and the king before moving on was like Oh dear, how like mama. <laughs> And Doris hadn't realized that she had Elvis. He sounds a little bit like Elvis. In my head, British people are like Elvis. Oh, 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 oh mama. mama, Queen D- Mama. Doris hadn't realized that she had unconsciously drawn Her Majesty Queen Mary, and as she. <laughs> you might said Queen Mary and bah, me my ring flies off. Um, <laughs> note heard around the world. <laughs> As she said, so Doris saw that she unconsciously drew Queen Mary. She said, needless to say, after he had left, I altered it. <laughs> she sounds great. The ballroom, which was designed by her sister, Anna, that has a theme of the four seasons. The the seasons, not the hotel chain or uh, the band. Is there a band called? No. Frankie not. Valley. And the, and yeah. the four band members and the four winters so there was a the main lounge which was air conditioned it had a 26 foot ceiling it ran through three of the seven decks 96 feet long first class pantries are only but third class and second class could come on sunday mornings for non-denominational church services <laughs> the most astounding of the interior elements is the wood which is made up of 56 of the world's finest and rarest woods it's used throughout the ship in public areas and it creates a quote warm and romantic ambiance here's something for daniel a list of the most famous passengers oh yeah this is what i like johnny westmuller Tarzan? Tarzan, Olympic, uh. LA Olympic, Olympian. Uh, you mean Tarzan. You mean Tarzan. <laughs> Loretta Young, Buster Keaton, uh. Laurel and Hardy. At the same time? Same time. Mm-hmm. Well, their names are separated, but it was an alphabetical list, so I imagine they were also on a photo together. So yeah, they're, they're the same time. One was on first class, one nah, was third class. You go you downstairs. Decide. We know who went downstairs. <laughs> Take this piano with you. <laughs> Take these three buckets of water with you. 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 <laughs> Liz and Robert Taylor, Gloria Swanson, <laughs> Wavy Hair himself, Liberace, Ooh. Bob Hope. Well, I mean- well, well Jack Benny probably got him a free ticket. <laughs> Dolores Del Rio, that's for me. Charlie Chaplin, Joey Brown, Winston Churchill. My favorite actor. Dwight G. Eisenhower, Robert Ford Jr., the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, and the forever mayor of Los Angeles, 
Mike Piazza. Mary, Mary Pickford. Really? Oh, yeah. Of course she was. The other I MP. knew she was on. <laughs> <laughs> Former shortstop for the Dodgers. <laughs> Mary, Mary Pickford. Pickford. This, of course she was on. Of course this she it's, it's, It happened in LA. Of course it happened. <laughs> of course she was there. This was the perfect spot to be rich. That's so crazy. I keep thinking like, oh yeah, it was in Los Angeles. They're all there. I'm like, no, it wasn't in Los Angeles yeah, yet. Yeah. It was yeah. on the East Coast. Like, they all went to <laughs> they New York. They didn't come to it when it landed in Los Angeles <laughs> in the 60s. It, yeah. This was the perfect spot to be a rich, famous, jitterbugging person in the 30s <laughs> living your lavishly. Like Eisenhower. Like Eisenhower. Living lavishly burning beautiful woodwork and carpets with cigarettes that fall out of your hand when you're drunk on six gin martinis and your name is Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> the Queen Mary is a beautiful luxury liner and a male transport, M-A-I-L, and nothing would ever male change escort. that. You're saying it's a male escort? Okay, <laughs> got it. Why it's don't they male. call postal workers male escorts? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Charles Bukowski was a male escort for a brief time. <laughs> he wrote a book about it. He's also a gigolo. So this is how it existed for some years, and nothing would ever change that. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, one thing would. In August of 1939, while sailing oh, no. around Germany, the captain received a message to, that said they needed to go 100 miles south of their normal path. It would be super cool if you did that. And they're like, cool, 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 why? They're like, well, there might be some German <laughs> submarines looking to kill Laurel Hitler! Hardy. <laughs> As they're sailing away. <laughs> Who? German submarines looking to kill Laurel Hardy. So the Queen Mary did that. I love that, that movie. <laughs> The Queen Mary did that, but it wouldn't be the last of these orders because in September of 1939, like maybe the 1st of September, the Germans invade Poland. And the mm-hmm. next day, the Queen Mary was given an urgent message to take all necessary precautions to guard against a submarine attack. Both Queen Marys, by the way. <laughs> the boat and the... It was actually meant for the Queen, but you know, the <laughs> ship should watch out too. The Germans want to kill Charlie Chaplin. Oh, what, what am I going to do about <laughs> it? So now they're given the direct orders. You need to do everything you can to get this ship safely to port. So the Queen Mary went into full zigzag mode. Mm-hmm. Crew members... Stop that. Crew members went out. But keep in mind the zigzag mode. Zigzag mode. That's coming up later. Crew members went out to the deck to be lookouts. Other crew members were sent. Straight to the bar. Straight to the bar. Other crew members were sent to cabins and staterooms, and they painted portholes black. Wow. All the running and deck lights were turned off. They raced zigzaggedly to New York to get passengers (laughs) off the Queen Mary into safe and That's so crazy for World War II to break out while you're like. While you're on. I know, right? (laughs) In the middle of like the war ground. And they're just like, we got to get these people safe to the safe tranquility of 1930s New York, you know? (laughs) Everything's safe for you to get to 1930s New York and go down that alley. We got to land it somewhere safe. Pearl Harbor. <laughs> the next morning, the passengers and crew, they they hadn't landed yet. The next morning, the passengers and crew listened as the ship broadcast the Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's message that the nation is at war with Germany. That nation being jolly old England, not America. We needed to be pushed a little bit harder. <laughs> so war is declared and that makes Queen Mary a very real target for the Nazis. Adolf Hitler wants to kill the Queen Mary and not the lady. Almost well. 10... Both. Nah, he wouldn't mind both. One or the other, but hopefully both. The boat's a little Jewish. <laughs> Let's take Something the boat a- first. <laughs> you let the Scottish build that? You know how I feel about them. Ambivalent. Almost 10 hours later, after the address, the Athenia, another British liner, was downed by German oh subs. My God. 112 passengers. And that was a, a White Star canard? I think it was a canard. I mean, no, it might have been. It, I think it was a White Star. Well, they're the same line now, so yeah, yeah, I guess so. But they were, it was another British liner. It was downed by German submarines. 112 passengers died. That was the first marine casualty of World War II. That happened the next day. Wow. Could have easily been the Queen Mary. So now the Queen Mary is suspended from passenger trips until the war is over. But would the Queen Mary sit and watch brave soldiers <laughs> risk their lives to protect the world together? <laughs> fascism dun, 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 dun. <laughs> or would this noble art deco ship rise to the occasion and fight the dang murderous yeah. nazis the second one she said the second one the queen mary enlisted for duty in march of 1940 anti-aircraft guns were mounted to the decks oh six inch guns were mounted to the stern move those sun chairs <laughs> chaplain put a helmet on <laughs> And it was the most hilarious thing you've ever seen. <laughs> it took 40 minutes for the helmet on. Her speed was a valuable asset to the war right. effort. It was said that in the early days of the war, the Queen Mary was faster than German torpedoes. Yeah. She truly was ghost-like on the sea. You, you Faster boat than com- a flying torpedo. Which was pretty slow. That has all that water in the Four way. Four miles per hour. Yeah. U-boat commanders would say that they would see the Queen Mary in their periscopes for a second before losing it. It would hmm. go out of range, like the last Jedi. As much as their speed was needed, so was her size. The Queen Mary would be used as troop transport and would right. carry 5,000 soldiers she donned a gray coat of paint to help camouflage her and she took on code name the gray Gray ghost Ghost. the scourge of the nazi u-boats now it's getting a little scary yeah so effective was the queen mary oh i mean uh, the gray ghost (laughs) that little old adolf hitler put himself a bounty on the head of queen mary to all the nazis who speaking of the mandalorian 
to the Nazis who would sink her, they would give Germany's highest military honor. We won't kill you when the war's <laughs> over. We'll hang you first, so you have to watch the rest of us be yeah. hung. Exempt from Nuremberg. <laughs> You'll find out what that means in four years. The Knights Cross to the Iron Cross with oak leaves and swords, which is only effective if fascism takes over the world. And $250. <laughs> only valid. Not valid. Not valid. In if. case of allied victory. <laughs> and you would also get $250 cash, but this was Hitler dollars. So again, mm -hmm. if effective if fascism takes over the world. The ship was an almost perfect military vessel almost perfect because mm -hmm. get this the ship was designed to withstand the brutal cold of the atlantic but now the queen mm, mary is i think you're dipping into my territory here let me hear what you have to say it's built for the cold not for the hot and now they have to go to places like singapore and australia and the lower decks are getting extremely hot mm -hmm. and remember the ship was initially designed to carry a couple thousand passengers comfortably now it had five thousand uncomfortable soldiers i know what you're about to say hang on hang on listeners Anything that, has to, anything that has to do with death. <laughs> if anyone dies, that's me. <laughs> if someone's tummy's hurt, that's you. They die, it's me. Got it? Am I finish this or not? You can edit it out later. Let's just say that it got a little hot and I'll get to what happens. It got a little hot. A little hot, a little heavy. Do you know about the options people got when they came aboard as a crew member or a no, soldier? No, I don't know that. You came aboard as a soldier or a crew member or a serviceman and they're like, okay, let's pay for your name, okay? Hey, so if you die, how do you want us to depose, oh, no. dispose of you? Do you want to be put in the freezer or do you want to put over? because we don't have a lot of room. Wow. Save that for later. I did not know that. I did not know that. We see on the boat. So after Pearl Harbor, the Queen Mary was handed over to the Amer American military. So the same Brits, soldiers, and crewmen remained, but the ship's missions were under American command now. They also retrofitted the ship to accommodate 8,000 soldiers. Oh God. Way more. Like putting beds in lounges, yeah. the drawing room, drained swimming pools. Soldiers slept in shifts because it was so overcrowded. A year later, Winston Churchill said, if, you know, if we can shorten the war by a day, even one day, the risk is worth taking. So in terms of what that meant for the Queen Mary, it meant adding another 2,000 soldiers. Now 10,000 soldiers riding a ship that was meant for like 2,000. More cannons and guns were installed and it was becoming a full-on warship. There were so many close calls. One in Rio de Janeiro, I didn't read the full details, but I know that there, there was a real close call, but it never took an attack. The ship's main prerogative was to always be moving. It, even if it meant passing by down liners with soldiers on lifeboats, it wouldn't mm -hmm. stop. It would just call, it would we'll radio. We'll that later. It would radio for people to come. No close calls as far as battle goes, but the Ooh. worst incident the ship was involved in happens in October of 1942 off the coast of Scotland. Greg, stop hang it. On. And uh, Daniel will address this segment later. I, I didn't hear that last part. Greg, you shut up. <laughs> shut up. I will cut your throat right here. Oh, hey. Hey, Greg, can I see you over here? <laughs> Okay, you can Bad sit back boy. <laughs> you can pull your pants back. <laughs> up, yeah. But get, let's get back to Winston Churchill. The Grey Ghost was his sea. The Grey Ghost was his seaborne headquarters. <laughs> Three times he rode the Grey Ghost to travel between Canada and the U.S., always traveling under the name Colonel Warden. Uh, always traveling under the name Oliver Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> Grumpy Oliver Hardy. W.C. Fields. <laughs> it was on the Queen Mary. Uh, oh, I mean, uh, they never sink W.C. Fields. <laughs> you can't. It was here on the Queen Mary. Oh, I mean, the Grey Ghost. Ah, the Grey Ghost. That Winston Churchill. I mean, oh, I mean. Colonel Warden. I mean, Alfred. it was on the Queen Mary that Winston Churchill first reviewed the plans for D Day yeah, and signed his name to it. Again, weird history thing. Yeah, it's this thing crazy. that's sitting in Long Beach helped end World War II. <laughs> it sent all these brave Americans over there to save <laughs> to everybody save else. Democracy. You know? <laughs> Anyways, we're here to save democracy. <laughs> <laughs> we're also we're here to introduce democracy and also <laughs> save democracy. Anyways, the Nazis lost and Hitler killed himself <laughs> and world war ii was over the queen mary was now utilized in bringing soldiers home from overseas for this many parts of the ship were once again refers to be a floating hospital for wounded soldiers the larger suites and drawing room were used as intensive care and surgical quarters and also there was a lot of isolation wards that still are there and they're the creepiest things i have a little bit to say about the isolation wards. i could tell you right now they're creepy and then again the that's queen what i had to say oh you said it all uh, Greg, uh, a word a word over here anything's creepy <laughs> <laughs> anything that's remotely Greg play pants uh, that rocking chair you talked about, was it rocking on its own? Okay, shut up. Thanks. <laughs> they bring all the soldiers back home. Some of them are wounded. Some of them just want to go home. And then after that, the next job of the Queen Mary, military-wise, they had to be refurbished again to accommodate all the wives and children of soldiers mm -hmm. who married women and fathered children in Europe while they should have been working. Uh, you're supposed to be crying in a foxhole alone. Mm -hmm. Who's she? So now instead of intensive care units or Art Deco orgy rooms, there was nurseries. Uh, no. I have a thing about the <laughs> A word. <laughs> Who's in the orgy? Okay, can you stop talking about it? Thanks. Why didn't you invite me to the orgy? Did anyone die in the orgy? Was Fatty Arbuckle there? Great. <laughs> A word? The word orgy. Her final military run was in September of 1946, ending in Nova Scotia and taking a long rest mm. after being Where demobilized. Mm -hmm. Where it all started. From once it... Well, actually, I was born in Scotland, but... Uh, <laughs> well, the idea... Was, mm, the, the, it, you were conceived here in... Uh, 
Nova Scotia. In all, as a warship, the Queen Mary carried more than 800,000 soldiers and a serviceman of many different countries, America, Canada, Australia, Britain. It took on more than 600,000 miles and played a part in every major allied campaign in World War II in some Crazy. way or another. And it managed to be that involved without being attacked by land, sea, or air, and also survived without passengers being seen. She also had never had to fire her guns during war. Hmm. Churchill called the Queen Mary instrumental in shortening the war. It would be almost a year, 1947, before the Queen Mary was restored to its pre-war glory and ready for its first peacetime voyage since 1939. Take off the war paint. <laughs> no longer the great... I, oh, that's the former me. <laughs> I've left all that behind. I'm Queen Mary the White now. And Again, an emphasis on white. She has PTSD, and every time a German person gets on, she fires cannons for some reason. <laughs> the Queen Mary carried on for two decades as a luxury liner, but as most things that were great in the 30s and 40s, by the end of the 50s, they were ancient and shrugged off. Right. Passenger travel dwindled, and the cost of having a giant Art Deco cruise ship were too high for all the people who were... It was airplane right, time. It was airplane time and a car time. The cost of having it was too high for all the people who weren't on it. She was too large to dock at most ports, but passengers would often have to be sent on to dock on smaller ships. People just found that annoying. Like, mm -hmm. I have to make a smaller ship. I'm going to see yeah. this one. <laughs> Shut up. You're riding on the boat where D-Day was planned. Mary Pickford. Mary Pickford, you chili dog eating weirdo. 1967, the Cunard Lines sold their heroic monumental ship and the, the, both the sisters, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth. But who would buy them? They were all kinds of bids. What Some, stupid city would possibly yeah. purchase such a thing? What small city in Southern California <laughs> that has always looked over would buy that? There were all kinds of bids for it. Some people wanted to turn it into a youth hostel. There was a Southern gentleman who wanted youth to... youth hostel? Yeah, I don't get that. I've been to a hostel before. It's bad. <laughs> hey, want to vibe? No. <laughs> Leave, oh, let me sleep. Let uh, me sleep in this room of 40 people <laughs> that are all orgying. I'm going to bed at 1030 and everyone's leaving at 1 to party. That's cool. A Southern gentleman wanted to weld the two sister ships together and have a catamaran. Wait a minute. He wanted to make a catamaran out of two of the biggest boats ever made? Yeah, it's that's pretty That's really cute. funny. Yeah. And I want to jet ski on him. Hey, dude, Southern. Shazam, I'm going to jet ski. No, that's too low class. He's a Southern gentleman. Oh, chip, chip, Oh, wrong one. So the, uh, who would buy this? It doesn't matter. Because on a sealed bid auction, the city of Long Beach in Los Angeles, California, bought the Queen Mary vessel for $3.45 million and planned on turning it into what it is now, a hotel, a tourist mm -hmm. attraction, and a maritime museum. But before retiring, the Queen Mary wanted to go on one last cruise. <laughs> what was advertised as the last... Through U-boat infested <laughs> waters. <laughs> one more time to Germany, guys. Let's hear him apologize again. This was advertised, this last cruise was advertised as the last great cruise of the RMS Queen Mary because getting the ship... I'm saluting. Single tier, the great ghost. There she goes. Before <laughs> getting the ship she... from... <laughs> because getting the ship from Southampton to Long Beach was not going to be easy because it was too big for the Panama Canal. They had to do this crazy oh journey. Yeah. This was going to be a journey and it was going to be a journey with passengers who were invited for the 39 days trip this last cruise hey, sign me up sign me up yeah <laughs> so leaving southampton on halloween the queen is it free sign me up uh, is that dollar charge the new yorkers got in the 1930s that still holds 30 years later <laughs> leaving southampton on halloween the queen mary went through the canary islands twice over the equatorial line along the eastern coast of brazil through the hazardous waters of cape horn and up the western coast of the america stopping along port cities along the way so basically on the first day they left and <laughs> let's walk through some of the highlights of this last cruise first day they hit winds through the bay of biscay that rocked them pretty hard and the sea turbulence caused a lot of people to get seasick and puke. It rained hard for two days. Then in Lisbon, a 21-year-old rail worker from Chicago named Stacy Miller stowed away on the ship, my kind of guy. He was caught and they offered him work as uh, to work off his fare for a dollar a day, which he accepted. <laughs> but we're going to deport you yeah, when you get when you, when you get to Los Angeles, we're going to deport you. That was day two. Stowaway. And they haven't even left Europe I yet. know, the, <laughs> day, day two. So they go to Los Palmas was the next stop and it was where passengers stocked up on clothes and alcohol in preparation for another long Lego trip, which was going to be like six days, 3,540 four mile trek through the tropics clothes. heading for the coast of south america and landing in rio after rio was valparicio and then lima panama acapulco by which point the passengers we're done. They <laughs> hated the trip. So they like up to this point, they were like so done being on a boat. Even though they had stops for days, they were like, eh, this Panama thing sucks. And then finally, after Acapulco landing in Long Beach on December 9th, 1967, 5,000 small boats welcomed the queen to her new home. Finally, 5,000 5, small boats of all kinds were in Long Beach waiting for the Queen Mary as a sacrifice. Parked in her spot. <laughs> Welcome to Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a permit to park here after nine? Finally, after 12 pages, we are in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. Arriving in Los Angeles did not mean the troubles were over for the Queen Mary, as in most transplants who come here thinking everything's going to be smooth sailing. Yeah. She still struggled financially through the years, needing repairing and modernization while lacking attendance. If you remember from our theme parks episode, it was being eyed by Disney for their Port Disney idea, right. but that fell through. For a time, the Queen Mary was leased by a man named Jack Ooh. Werther.
Werther. It was owned by Disney for a little bit. Yeah, though. it was owned yeah. by Disney. Yeah, Jack Werther took over after that, I believe. And he he's the guy who owned Howard Hughes' Spruce Goose. Yeah. And he thought it'd be a cute <laughs> idea if these two cartoonishly large transports <laughs> were next to each other. So for, that was a thing for a while. It was Spruce Goose and Queen Mary were right next to each other in Long Beach before it was taken to a museum. But what, I wish Long Beach just became like the fun house of, <laughs> of crazy old boats. <laughs> Here's a really long pogo stick. <laughs> yeah. and people are like, whoa, that's pretty big. His lease ended and the Queen Mary was returned to the city of Long Beach. It's been through a lot of closures and reopenings and different people owning it and operating it. The Queen Mary exists now as a beautiful and somewhat crooked hotel in Long Beach. Yeah, you are welcome to stroll along the old corridors and decks. There's plenty of historic displays or the ship. It's a beautiful Art Deco piece. I, I truly love the Queen Mary. The cabins are neat. I love portholes, original Art Deco restaurants and halls, the mural. I love I love murals. Something else is there though, isn't there, Daniel? Something you, you can't see. 